Okay. All right. All right. Welcome back, guys. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, this is Sashko. Um, I'm Helen, and I teach at the Dorothy Benson Senior Services Center in Sandy Springs. And today we're going to talk about Sashko stitching, which is uh, Japanese folk art stitching. And I do have a um, PowerPoint to show you, okay? So let's go over to screen share and do the PowerPoint. All right. All right, can everybody see this? All right. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, good. So it's called sashiko and it just means, it's just a simple running stitch and it just means small piercing. So, um, but the thing is that it creates pretty cool designs. It's very simple, just a running stitch, but it looks very complex, doesn't it? Now, um, all over the world, you have the straight, you know, running stitch kind of thing. And then in India, you have the contact cloth, which is like thin layers of um, silk saris, you know, stitch with running stitches and everything. But um, these are a little bit different than that. And probably, you have, probably haven't seen this so much, maybe in Africa, okay? So it started in the snow country of Northern Japan. And the reason why is, okay, see that dark blue? That place mm -hmm. is all frozen, okay? And in the winter, it's very, very cold there. And the growing season is short and um, cotton can't grow there. Now, back in the olden days, the people had to wear uh, hemp, fabric made out of hemp. And so it's kind of like rough linen, all right? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, cotton was a very uh, rich nobody had cotton okay so cotton doesn't grow up here where it's cold now how cold does it get and uh, let's see sometimes it gets this cold okay do you see that bus there okay mm -hmm. they get a lot of snow mm -hmm. now traditionally the old houses look like this and sometimes mm -hmm. the snow would come all the way up to uh, the first floor and wow. people would have to use these entrances and exits to get out in and out okay and walk mm -hmm. on the snow with snowshoes so it's very cold country um nowadays it's a little bit better but there are still some people who whose houses are cold they may not live in those kind of traditional houses but they're still cold and mm -hmm. back then back then all they had was this hearth okay mm -hmm. and the smoke would go up the roof and um, people really were cold because if you look in the background, it's just paper, guys. <laughs> That's just wow. paper. Wait uh, yes. <laughs> and I, I grew up in Japan and uh, my mother wow. is Japanese, my father is Texan. And we would go visit, you know, where my mother grew up and everything. And, um, and um, those houses, they forget insulation, okay? So this was the actual house. She grew up in the mountains and it's no glass, guys, this is paper. <laughs> and if there was rain or storm, there would be wooden, thin, very thin plywood, wooden storm doors, okay? And so think open air and there's no central heating. You know, you have that hearth there. And so what people would do, <laughs> And the person on the left is my great great grandmother. This is a hibachi. You heard the um, in America they call it hibachi or something, but this is an actual hibachi. It's a ceramic pot, and inside it's full of ashes. And they put hot coal and bury hot coal in there, so you warm your hands. <laughs> you're cold everywhere else. Okay, trust me, you're cold. <laughs> um, living in Japan, um, I was cold. Uh, we, we were sort of westernized. We didn't have central heat. We had a kerosene stove that my, um, had a chimney on it, so we didn't have to open the windows. But sometimes when you go visit some of these houses in Japan, they'll have a little kerosene portable heater, and you have to open the windows. <laughs> you have to crack open the windows, otherwise you'll... you'll... Okay. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay, now our residents. Management has investigated the alarm and it is a false alarm. The system tripped. 
Do not leave the buildings all as well. We again, we apologize for the inconvenience. Thank you. Oh, that was loud. Okay. That would wake me up. Okay, at least we know what it works. All right. So anyway, um, so they would warm their hands like this. And so, like I said, when you visit somebody's house, um, you wore thick sweaters. In the, and I'm talking about the Tokyo area where it doesn't get as cold as this area, okay? So um, they live in this very cold area and they had to, you know, back in the Northern country, the people weren't rich at all because, you know, the growing season's short. They don't have much money. Um, there are really not many products they can sell. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, they had to wear clothes made out of hemp, and um, the hemp fluff was used for batting. And um, somehow, little bits of cotton, and it's probably leftover cotton or old cotton clothes, kimono, would make its way up north. And the rags were used for patching. Okay, and also against the skin because it's a lot warmer. Mm -hmm. And they would um, unweave the cotton threads and use that and st stitch into, you know, uh, the hemp fabric. And mm -hmm. so think of hemp as like roughly woven linen. Mm -hmm. um, so you would have, you know, you would see the eyes, of the, you know, you would see little holes in the fabric. And basically they're weaving in more, more uh, thread. <clears throat> so um, there are some, some um, um, rags, <laughs> boro means rags, okay? Mm -hmm. um, some boro garments still um, left over and some are in museums now, but basically people were desperate and they just took patches of that's cotton right there and they would just take scraps and just stitch it on there with however they could. Um, and then some were a little bit more refined, okay? But so this person, this is a, padded vest, vest, quilted vest. Um, and you just wore layers and layers and layers. So this was stitched, um, just random stitching and, you know, patches of, um, I, I'm not sure, I don't think it has cotton in the bedding. I think it's probably hemp fiber. Okay, so you're stuck in the snow and probably six months out of the year. And so there's lots of time. This, we're talking about in the olden days, there's lots of time for slow stitching and uh, very slow stitching and uh, almost like meditation, okay? Mm -hmm. so, um, so they would have to take the, you know, they couldn't just go down to the store and get by thread because remember these villages and most of them were villages and um, they're kind of, Japan is mostly mountainous. So when it snowed, you couldn't really get to the other village. You're stuck, you know, at home with mm -hmm. your uh, clan. Um, my mother grew up in way in the mountains, and there were probably, let's see, about five or six little tiny villages uh, along the mountain path, and hers was second from the top. Um, when she says villages, um, it turns out it's really a clan. They all had the same last name. So it was somebody's cousin or somebody's, you know, uncle or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she grew up in a place that had, well, I think there were like five houses. Okay. So anyway, people are isolated. They're stuck. So they have plenty of time to come up with, and somebody, somebody finally came up and says, why can't we make designs out of these uh, running stitches? So since it was mostly white thread on indigo fabric or brown fabric, brown fabric is usually um, the mud stain fabric. And so um, they decided, you know, they would just make patterns and you will see waves, tortoise shells, blowing grass, you know, it was basically based on nature, inspired by nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where am I here? Yeah. Uh, basket, fishing nets, things that they see around. So these were, this is basically folk art. Um, and then here's one. Now they do sell pre-printed kits now. So you can follow the designs. You don't have to draw them out yourself. So mm -hmm. my mother stitched this and turned it into a pillow. So nowadays it's become popular. When I was growing up, um, 1960s and 70s living in Japan, people didn't really get into this. Okay, um, because it was it still had a stigma, you know, still like poor people's art kind of thing, a uh, craft kind of thing. So they didn't really get into it. And then like around the 90s, you know, and late 80s, it started to become really popular. 
Um, I think it's because a lot of the Japanese companies during the boom uh, would bring their families to the States, you know, to work for three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. And um, the housewives would be introduced to things like quilting. Back then, American quilting was unknown in Japan, uh, like in the 60s. And so they got interested in that. And then when they realized that America had all these uh, folk crafts, they looked into their own Japanese background and realized, hey, we have things like sashiko, that's pretty cool. So that's how it got popularized. And right now, you know, it's pretty popular. So here's some more examples. You can get these pre-printed uh, kits and you do the stitching and this is just um, painted on there. So my mother did those kits and more uh, cushions and, um, and then here's a mat, like a table mat, you know, and that's the wave design, okay? Um, so anyway, it's always uh, existed in the background. You know, we were always aware of it, but it didn't really become popular until like late 80s and 90s, really. And um, now you can like even, um, you'll see like colored threads instead of the usual white on indigo you'll see the colored threads. And um, I made this a long time ago, so it's colored thread with um, some Japanese fabric on it. And then here's some that I made. I just, I, I stitched this for fun. And this is that variegated thread, you know, the pearl cotton variegated thread, where it changes mm -hmm. color from dark to light, to dark to light. Yeah, those are really cool to work with, by the way. So I put that on a cover. I just covered one of those composition notebooks because I needed one for a workshop I was taking. And then I had I stitched this on the other part of the fabric for fun. And um, so I used that scrap, that test piece sample I made and I covered that um, composition book and I stitched this on so I can have a pen there. So it's kind of fun, you know, to do just little samples because you can like, this was a flip phone, cell phone, um, holder, <clears throat> excuse me. And then um, you can buy pre-printed pre uh, double layer cotton, very thin cotton. Well, these are really for like, uh, what is it? Dishcloth? Yeah, dishcloth. So you can buy that. And I use variegated thread here. But if you look here, I didn't finish. That's the printing. I didn't finish here either because I got bored following the marks. <laughs> more fun to make my own designs you know so here I had made some samples of my own designs just little test pieces you know um you know especially in the winter when you're stuck inside and watching tv it's just fun to make mm -hmm. these little, mm -hmm. little thingies okay and um now here is one where I instead of white on indigo color fabric I use like navy thread, indigo color thread on beige linen. Okay, another scrap piece of fabric I had laying around. I thought I'd try this design. Okay, now what are you gonna do with all these? Okay, so I also even tried like my own design. All right, I just for practice, just for fun. I actually finished this bag by the way. And I made radishes and carrots and I thought, oh, well, you know, whatever. And I had a bunch of these little samples laying around, but I never threw them away. And recently I actually um, sold a couple of them for like a dollar. <laughs> I said, here, you, you buy this for a dollar and do something with it. You know, my original intention was to do a pot holder out of these two, but I just lost interest again. Um, <laughs> so now I did turn some of these into like, these were the old flip phone covers. Okay, so here you can put your sunglasses in that thing. Mm -hmm. um, pin cushion, okay. And then mm -hmm. this one actually I still use, it's my check, checkbook holder, okay. Um, now, I actually had to do, I had to do several workshops. So I finally finished that bag. <laughs> That's a denim bag, okay. I do have to line it because on Sashiko, the back side is all raw, you know, all the threads are everywhere. So um, you do have to line the stuff. <clears throat> um, this is the popular hemp leaf pattern and I turned it into a crossbody bag. Um, I think that's on denim, yeah. And you know how you have purses laying around that you don't use anymore? Well, that came off of an old purse, you know, all these gadgets. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You don't have that. You can always go to the thrift store and buy a cheap purse, you know, look for the gadgets you can use. <laughs> mm-hmm. No need to buy them, right? Now, I use this book. Nowadays, you have all kinds of books, but I use this book. It's written in English. And um, what I did was, um, what, what the good thing about this is it tells you in what order to go. So it'll tell you, go here first, go here next, you know. And that helps save thread and it helps the thread from being bunched up in the back um, of the fabric. So somebody figure that out, okay? Now, there are other books I haven't had, you know, I haven't looked at them or anything because I have this one and it works for me, okay? Now, so don't, don't just jump into making a big project. Just make those little samples like I did. Um, you can always use it for something, you know, later on. Now, I did, I did make some that were garments. Um, this, this is wool crepe that I threw in the washer a million times, washer and dryer to beef it up. Mm-hmm. And um, I had some leftover uh, rayon and I needed something warm to wear in the clay studio because I work in clay. So I made this vest and at first I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just put a little design here. Well, and then I decided, well, I'll just put another design here. And then, you know, it just got out of control and the whole thing is stitched. Okay. Um, way too much. And then, um, so here's another, this is a um, cooler, not cooler, not so hot studio garment. <laughs> And I just put stitching on this shoulder. Now, the back side, um, because this is one simple spiral, mm-hmm. there's a few places I might have knots, but it's not like a whole bunch of stuff going on in the background, okay? And mm-hmm. it's some cheap polyester pretend linen fabric. And, you know, you know, a lot of people just wear old t-shirts in their clay st- in the clay studio. Well, I have to look cool, right? So... <laughs> I had to make these, plus I had a lot of fabric. Here's another one. This is a wool crepe jacket. And then this is wool gauze. And I threw it in the washer and dryer three times to shrink it up. And I just did random spiral stitches. And this is variegated. Um, I think it's tensile. I misspelled here. It's tensile thread. It's just uh, something I found at a weaver's, hand weaver's guild. Yeah, I collect thread too. All right, you don't have to cover your entire garment. You can just do little accents, okay? So I I put a little accent on the sleeve part here. All right, what kind of thread am I using? Now, if you go online and look at Sashiko stuff, um, they'll say you have to use Sashiko fabric, you have to use Sashiko thread, blah, blah, blah. Now, keep in mind, originally, people just use whatever fabric, whatever rags they could get their hands on, whatever thread. Okay. You don't have to use the sashiko fabric or the sashiko thread. It doesn't matter. Try out different types of thread and see what you like the best. Okay. Um, I like the pearl cotton hank thread, embroidery thread, the number five, not the number eight, not the number three, which is thicker. I just like the number five. It works for me. Um, I have tried all kinds of threads. Um, one of the projects I might try yarn on wool crate. Okay. So, um, you know, excuse tried... me, the name of the thread you're using is the length, the, the name of the oh, thread hey. you're using. Um, do you see right here on the bottom? It says pearl cotton thread right here. Pearl cotton. Uh-huh. Pearl cotton. Oh, okay. okay. Sometimes, sometimes it, I don't know. You know what? I don't, I call it pearl, but let me see if it has a different name. Oh, I think it's different brands, but they just call it pearl cotton. Sometimes it's P-E-R-L-E. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know why they call it. I think maybe it, it's because it has a shine to it, you know, like mm-hmm. a pearly shine. Maybe that's why. It it doesn't it doesn't come apart like embroidery thread. You oh. know, embroidery thread, you can divide it and it pulls apart. Um, this doesn't. This is twisted. That's why you get that shine. Okay. okay. So, oh, okay. Where can we find it? Uh, you can get it online. You can find it at Michael's. You can find it at Joanne's. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, one if I I like to do if I'm going to do white or off white, I kind of like off white because the white is a little bit too stark. But you know, it depends on what you like. Um, 
well, oh, if I'm going to do it on a dark fabric like indigo, and this is linen, usually I use linen. You can use linen, you can use linen cotton, you can use denim, you can use cotton, you know, you can use whatever fabric. Remember that other one that I used, uh, polyester, okay? This was a scrap that somebody gave me, and I had enough to make this little kimono, kimono top. Um, so I just used that. Um, uh, you, you know, you can, it, like I said, you, you should make small samples first and see if you like what it looks like, okay? Now, um, if I use a dark fabric for the marker, this is what I use. I use the Clover brand uh, white pen, marking pen, yeah. And I'll show you after the uh, PowerPoint is over, okay? I just like that. Um, some companies might make something similar to that, but um, that's what I use, okay? And the reason why I like that is because, um, remember that denim bag I showed you earlier? This one, okay? Mm -hmm. I drew out the design and I forgot about it. I did the bird, then I forgot about the whole thing for about a year and a half. When I found <laughs> the bag again, Mm -hmm. among all the things I forgot. The mark was still there, okay? Oh. The mark doesn't disappear unless you use a hot steam iron. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like that marker. Um, I don't know if other companies have copied that or not, but, um, you know, it, it is kind of costly. You can get it on Amazon mm -hmm. uh, cheaper. It's about, maybe about $8 on Amazon. Okay, people will say you need to use sashiko needles. All right, difference between sashiko needles and embroidery needles. The sashiko needles, the eye part is really thin, okay? Embroidery needles, the eye part is kind of thick, so it's kind of hard to pull it through the fabric sometimes. Um, you don't have to use sashiko needles. What I found that you can use is they sell this thing called doll needles, D-O-L-L, -L, and um, the one I found came in a pack of like three different lengths. Those needles are very long. They're very sharp. And those work pretty good to me. Um, not the biggest, not the longest one, but the shortest one. The shortest one was still long, you know, and it worked really good. So you can use that. You can try different embroidery needles. You know, you just need a bigger eye for the um, floss to go through. Um, I just happened to have a bunch of sashiko needles from a long time ago and then, and then the doll needles. So you don't need to have like special needles. You don't need to have like special uh, floss. You can try using the six strand um, embroidery floss if you want. You can even like divide it and use only four strands. Um, I've tried using silk thread. It, it, I didn't like the way it shined, okay? The silk floss. Um, embroidered thread. So I just like the pearl cotton. It just works for me. Okay. So um, here is, um, okay. Oh, here's a pearl cotton. It's number five too. Uh, per, and see here it's spelled P-E-R-L-E. -E, so I guess this is the French brand or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, pearl, this is French. French, right? Yeah, pearl yes. cotton is Sashko. So um, this is pearl cotton and the sashiko thread is much thinner. Now, the problem with the sashiko thread is you probably most likely have to buy it online because it's imported from Japan and it's expensive and you have to buy a lot, okay? Because the hanks are very small. Pearl cotton, it comes in all kinds of colors. You can buy it at Joann's. It, it, it is kind of expensive. It's like $3 something for a hank, but you know, it's easy to find. All right, so this one, I, I don't know what this is, what I did here. I think this is Sashiko thread because it looks really thin, okay? Um, I just don't like the way Sashiko thread looks. Okay, so um, this is when I was doing the kits and the, and the thing, but here's, I'll show you the bag, okay? I'll show you both of these bags, okay. Now, uh, one thing, some books will tell you all kinds of rules, like how to, how to tie the knot, how, you know, when you first start, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't pay attention to any of that. If you're, embroider if you're an embroidery person, maybe you, you know, pay attention to all that. But the thing I pay attention to is, these are supposed to be the stitches, the threads, okay? 
-hmm. So if your thread is three units long, okay, if I divide it up in three, the space between, if you aim for two units, it looks better. It just visually looks better. And let me see if I can give an example. You can't, that's not a good one. Oops, that's not it. Okay, you can't tell on this, but I aim for three unit length and two. So the space is just slightly less than the length of the thread. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you aim for that, it looks good. And so same thing here, five, you know, if, if you divide uh, the stitch in the blank space into five units, you got ratio of three to two, okay? So the blank space is less than the stitch length, okay? I put three eighths inch, but it's really wrong. Um, the stitch should be about three sixteenths of an inch. So it's much smaller than three eighths, okay? Now, let's say you come to a, oh, so down here, see? Don't make little teeny tiny dots and don't make long loops because they do catch on things, okay? So you, it's recommended you do the three to two ratio. And this is wrong, it's not three, it's three sixteenth of an inch. I have to change that. Okay, let's say you come to a sharp corner, okay? You need to, this is the backside of the fabric, you need to give it a little loop. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is if you don't give it a loop, you know, if you just go straight here, that these stitches will try to curve towards each other and won't look straight. It'll slant. It's just a, a physics thing, I guess. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example. Now, when you pick up, so here's an example of the sharp corner. See, I made a little loop here, and then I made another loop here, okay? Mm -hmm. That's, this is the backside of the fabric. And then if I have a long jump, okay? This is the backside of the fabric. I'm going to make a loose uh, join thread, okay? Don't make it tight because it'll pull on the other side. Um, when you stitch with Sashko, it's recommended if you want a straight line, pick up three stitches at a time, okay? It just makes it a neater, straighter line. And I think this is the front of the fabric. Oh, mine's not neat and straight, but see these three stitches, they're kind of in a line because I picked up those three stitches together. I don't know what happened to this guy. He's not behaving, is he? Okay, now, there are a few rules to make it, the reason why we have these rules is people found out it looks better. Your end product looks better if you follow these rules. Okay, when you come to an intersection like this, don't cross over that stitch, okay? Leave a tiny little space between all four stitches right here. <clears throat> When you come to a T intersection, once again, leave a stitch, don't, don't connect anybody. Understand that? Now, you can, if you come to a corner, you want to make one stitch reach the corner. Don't leave a blank space because then, you know, you're, it just visually doesn't look good. When you come to the center where you have several intersections, you want to leave a, I didn't even draw a circle here, but it looks like a circle, right? Because you're leaving space. Don't cross over those stitches, okay? And then the back side, if you have a big jump, make it loose. Don't make it tight like this, okay? Loose, 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 all right? And same here at the, um, at the sharp corners. Loose, loose, loose. Don't make it tight like that, okay? Now, when you're sewing, uh, you want all your stitches to be kind of loose. You don't, you don't want to make them tight, okay? They should be sort of loose, okay? Now, notice right here, I come to the center of this circle. I'm not stitching a circle here. I'm just marking where my stitch is going to stop. So this guy stops here. This guy stops here. This guy, when I stitch, 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 I'm going to stop here at the last stitch, okay? And that's, that's all that means, okay. Um, this was for a hemp leaf. Um, when I was doing a workshop, we did the hemp leaf and it looks really complicated, but it just, just following the direction and it's really easy, but 
let's not get into that right now. Now, I do have a blog spot I just made just for the Sashiko. You can go there um, and there will be instruction for the hemp leaf. Now, my problem is this. I don't know how to send the hemp leaf pattern to you, okay? I might be able to create a PDF and uh, you might have to print it out. So that's the only problem I have. How do I get the pattern to you? Um, you can look on blog sites, you know, different Sashiko blog sites, and maybe some of them you can print it out. But um, I don't know what else to do here. So um, let's just continue on real quick. <clears throat> so uh, with the little fun samples, you you know, we can make little pin cushions just for your special needles. Okay, so all I did was draw a flower pattern, and these are French knots. Okay. I didn't iron this so you can still see my white mark, All right? And then I just made another pin cushion. This is just cardboard covered in fabric, All right? So um, if you want the, you know, my address for the blog spot, you can just watch this video again and come to this page and um, you'll see, okay? All right, so um, do you have any questions so far before I jump into this? <clears throat> no? Okay, so I have here uh, indigo fabric. It's linen actually. And what I did was to draw the design, I used my clover pen. Okay, what is this? Yeah, here it is. Okay, and it's the um, white marker. And it, it's just like a ballpoint pen. Okay, and the coolest thing about this is when you first draw on it, you think it's not working, right? So I'm gonna draw a line and you won't see my line. Let's see if this even shows up. Maybe I need something to pop this up. See if this will work. All right, I think it's kind of dark. Okay, when I first draw a line, you're not going to see it. And then slowly it shows up. Let's see if it shows up. Okay, do you see it slowly showing up? See, yeah. now I have a line. Yeah, this is the weirdest thing. So it's kind of hard when you're first tracing something with this or drawing something with this because the line first doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. Now, what I do is you can, you know, use whatever kind of fabric, but I iron the fabric onto freezer paper. And if you're a quilter, you know, you know about freezer paper, right? You can just go to the grocery store, buy freezer paper, and it's coated on one side with plastic. The shiny side has a thin layer of plastic on it. And that side um, melts, the plastic melts onto the fabric. And the reason why I do that is because it stabilizes the fabric versus, you know, the fabric's gonna move around, especially linen. So I can draw out my design. Now this design, um, I just kind of traced it. I just used the ruler. I still don't know which way, I, where I'm going to actual stitch, but it's kind of fun. What I've been doing all the way up until now, mostly is, um, you can buy these Sashiko stencils online, just Google Sashiko stencils, and you can trace it with this, okay? And I have lots of these different kind of traditional designs, but I just decided I'm going to try something that I've never tried before. So I did that. Um, this is the pearl cotton thread. I like. This is the pearl cotton thread I like to use. This one happens to be an anchor brand, okay? But it is number five, okay? So on these, um, what, you, what you do is you take it apart and um, there's a knot here that keeps it together, okay? So you take it apart and see where it's tied right there? Okay, you only make one cut, don't make two cuts, okay? You might think you make two cuts, but you make one cut, you just cut the whole thing. 
And then, so you had this long piece, okay? Um, and then you just slide one out. Now, I also did buy, because I'm getting old and I can't see anymore, I did buy one of these Clover brand. Um, this is on my blog site too. Um, I just have I just have this little bell on here so I can find it because otherwise I lose it. Okay, it has a cover on it somewhere. And if you're very gentle, <laughs> um, it slides in. This actually is a sashiko needle, so the eye is smaller. It's narrow versus. I'm going to show you. Okay, when you buy a doll needle kit. Um, you, I think they come in three different sizes and yeah. And so this size actually works really good. Okay. And it's not, doesn't bulge out like um, embroidery needles do. Let me show you the embroidery needle. Okay. So okay, this, sure. this would be the embroidery needle. See how it, the eye bulges out? And this one's more straight. Yeah, this kind of gets in the way, this bulging part, all right? So, and then the sashiko needle is a little bit thinner and it comes in all different types. So it gets confusing too. Um, and, and I can tell this is sashiko needle because it's gold right here, okay? I don't know if it's real gold, but it's golden color. All right, let's see if I can show you. Okay, see how it's straight up and down and the, um, it doesn't bulge out like the um, embroidery needle, okay? So I just use one of these things and I actually bought two of these because just in case I break one, um, I don't cry. I have a backup. Okay, so you're supposed to be able to stick this in that little slot. And it works great for like, uh, you know, they, they sell the smaller ones, but this one's really for bigger eye, um, bigger eye what? Needles, yeah. So you just stick it in here and then um, be gentle, okay? And then pull it out. So that threads my thread. So this this thread is long, okay? But that's, the, that's what I use, the pearl cotton um, thread. Now, um, I'm going to show you a couple of samples. Oh, on the freezer paper. So once I draw out my design, um, I just peel off the freezer paper, okay? Sometimes you can use the same freezer paper over and over for a while. Yeah. Oh, we'll do that now. Um, <clears throat> So we did that zippered pouch. Well, I made one out of the Sashko fabric I designed. I mean, I stitched, all right? I wouldn't do this again. Um, I would plan out ahead of time and leave like a border because it, the, it just got bulky here with, with all this stitching, okay, extra stitching. But I think it's pretty stunning. <laughs> um, and then with some of the samples, I, I made a little mat, you know, cause I'm always eating or drinking something by the computer. So I can put a glass or something and whatever else I'm eating. So I'm, it's just concentric circles, that's all it is. And a ginkgo leaf, okay? I just drew it freehand, but you can, you know, go online and print out something. So here was that um, thing I made and the, excuse me, this holds my sunglasses and inside is kind of like um, pretend suede fabric so that the, my sunglasses don't slip out. Um, here is one where I actually made, this is lightweight denim fabric. It's actually tensile denim, okay? So I made a whole bag out of that and this one is lined, all right? And then I made a square sample for one of my workshops. And I turned it into a pocket for this bag, which I made. And um, I think it comes out pretty stunning, okay? It's not, it's not a canvas, I think this is canvas. And so that's a pocket, all right? So you can do all kinds of things with it. Now, um, this is supposed to be a interactive class, meaning hands-on, meaning I you know, hope you guys will stitch along with me. Um, I'm going to start this, and so ho I'm hoping that you guys have some kind of a, 
a dark blue fabric next time and some thread and needle. And um, if you can't transfer a design, you can do any kind of design. If you have those stencils, those, um, what do you call it? Quilting stencils for quilting, you know, they have mm -hmm. like hats. You can probably use that. When I first did this, they didn't sell this, um, they didn't have this pen. So I had to use chalk and it was frustrating because the chalk lines would disappear, you know, as you're working on the fabric. Mm -hmm. um, I, on this, this one, I think what I'm gonna do is, um, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna go for that three to two ratio. And I think I'm going to end up just before I hit that intersection, okay? And then jump over to here. Now, when you stitch, you really need to keep your um, stitching loose. And like I said before, you kind of want to pick up like three stitches at a time. Um, I, don't, I can't see this. And your stitch length should be about three sixteenths of an inch. Okay. You don't want it to look like little dots either. So, and because it's just a running stitch, if you mess up real bad, you can just pull out the, the thing. Now, I picked up three stitches. And then what I do is I kind of pull the fabric because I don't want this to be tight at all. Okay. Do you see how it's kind of like laying on top of the fabric? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Now, when you come to an intersection, you're gonna go, oh no, I got one stitch length too long. We just kind of fudge it. Because when you finish the whole thing, it's gonna look good. Okay, so now I'm going to, I didn't even draw this correctly. Okay, I'm just gonna jump over there to the other side. Now, what I'm probably, since this is just a grid that I drew myself, um, I'm probably just going to go back and forth, back and forth, and then do the back and forth, back and forth. I'm not going to do the diagonal lines first because diagonal stitching is going to stretch my fabric because it's going to be on the bias. So once I do the top ones and once I do the sideways ones, and then I'm going to do the diagonal ones. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so you want to keep the diagonal ones last. Okay. So that's about all I can say for today. And um, if you can, see if you can find some, um, if you want to try this with me, see if you can find some, you know, you can even try it on denim. It might be a little bit hard to stitch through, but it's possible. And draw yourself some kind of a design, even if you have to do it on, I don't think pencil will show up on denim, right? Um, I, some, you know, the quilters have all kinds of um, gadgets and tools, marking tools. So maybe you can use some one of those quilting pen, pencils or something. And um, so once again, I stitch it and I, I just kind of keep it loose. Okay. So, you know, it might be boring because I'm going back and forth. And, but once I start reaching the finish line, it's going to look pretty cool, I think. Right. Any questions? Do you think you're interested in doing this next time? Okay, for the intersection, we need to, to skip the intersection or you can just go through the intersection. You see how you have like a cross? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand what you just said. What was this again? You know, you have a cross when you're doing. Oh. Sometimes you have a cross, yeah. You have to skip, to skip it or just so uh, you can... Uh, um, you can sew on, yeah, like is like a, a cross. Uh, oh, this is yeah. actually linen, okay? Um, mm -hmm. I, I sew my own clothes, so I have a lot of leftover fabric, mm -hmm. okay? So let's say you didn't have dark fabric like this. Let's say mm -hmm. you only have white, okay? Then you okay. would use, you know, like dark blue or blue mm -hmm. um, embroidery thread. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, draw your designs. If you use white fabric, whitish fabric, you can um, uh, lightly draw your designs with pencil. Because after you wash it, the pencil box go away anyway. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And okay. as far as the design, if you can, um, 
uh, Google or Sashko traditional, you can try traditional or you can try your own grids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can come up with your own design, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So okay. that'd be cool. And then uh, once I finish this, you know, I, what am I going to turn it into? Well, maybe right now I'm not inspired, but it could be the pocket on the bag. It mm -hmm. could be pocket on a jacket. Mm -hmm. It could be a you know a little bag itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I wanted to, I can even make it into a pot holder, fancy pot holder. <laughs> 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 or we can make a zip block, zip pouch, zippered pouch. <laughs> okay, any questions? It's just simple, straight stitching. It does have a few rules, but um, it's actually kind of fun to do. A lot of people enjoy doing this. It, at first, it might seem like, oh gosh, that's so much work, but because it's like mindless, straight stitching, it's really not hard at all. And um, it's actually kind of relaxing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And since we have, we can't go anywhere anyway. I mean, or you should, you know, you shouldn't be going out to parties and all that. You know, you're stuck at home anyway, so you might as well um, do something like this. Now, this might be fun, like if you do patchwork, mm -hmm. it might be fun to make a bunch of different designs in squares, large squares. 12 inch squares and put them together mm -hmm. all right and put them mm -hmm. together sash in the sashing that might be spectacular okay all right okay so hopefully we'll see you next week okay okay all thank right you. thank you for the class you're welcome all okay. right bye-bye okay. bye, bye. bye.